Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. In this video I'll be kind of doing a bit of a response to Bald Cafe's video called quote, the hair loss industry is terrified you'll know this, unquote. And in this video he talks about how essentially the quote-unquote hair loss industry from I guess the pharmaceutical companies and the studies they make as well as the advertisements that people get, they kind of make androgenetic alopecia and I guess forms of hair loss in general seem like their diseases. And because there's this framing that it is a disease, that is what primarily distresses people when they go through hair loss. Now, I'm really just going to splice another video that I made where I actually do go into detail in why I think androgenetic alopecia is not just a skin disorder, but also a you know, some sort of skin disease. And there's a reason why all these studies actually use that framing, because it's a condition that has a pathology where skin structures, your hair follicles, for example, are being destroyed. Not only that, but when it comes to androgenetic alopecia, it's often comorbid with other conditions like seborrheic dermatitis. And there's a link between the two conditions. And that link is androgens, particularly DHT. So in one instance, we recognize that seborrheic dermatitis is a skin disorder and a skin disease, but for some reason we don't extend that, or at least Bald Cafe isn't extending that sort of terminology to androgenetic alopecia. So maybe he doesn't know, or maybe he's just trying to downplay that. So the segment that I'm going to play is around three minutes long, and then I'll respond that when he's done talking. A moment. The disease framing, this is the key point here, guys. The disease framing of baldness. Just three of the studies had an explicit acknowledgement that baldness was not a disease. When more medicalized or specific terms were deployed, individuals were more favorable to invasive diagnosis or interventions and rated the condition as more severe and experienced more anxiety, more distress, right? So if you go in, you're like, right, oh, how do I do, deal with this building with this bonus? And then you've got all these doctors, all these studies, all this stuff, and like, mate, this disease, needing medical intervention disease, you know, you're going to be like, oh no, what's wrong with me? I've got this disease. It's scary, to be honest. It's scary, right? How far this has come. So I know I said I'd let the Bald Cafe clip play out, but I do want to respond here. Androgenetic alopecia has a distinct pathological process, right? This process is influenced by a combination of hormonal changes, particularly 5-alpha reductase, coming in contact with testosterone, which produces DHT. And people who have the genetics for androgenetic alopecia, when the DHT comes in contact with the androgen receptors in the hair follicles, it suppresses them and ultimately causes them to essentially die in the long term. So you have this destructive process to skin tissue or a skin structure being the hair follicle itself. Because eventually in that area, if nothing is done to prevent that sort of miniaturization process, the hair follicle is replaced with scar tissue. Not only that, but androgenetic alopecia is often comorbid with other conditions like seborrheic dermatitis. And we know that seborrheic dermatitis has a basis in androgens, particularly DHT. DHT likes to make the sebaceous glands in the scalp overactive, and this causes the scalp to produce sebum that has high triglycerides and cholesterol content, which ultimately leads to certain bacteria growing on the skin and further inflaming the skin of the scalp. And seborrheic dermatitis itself is a skin disease, is a skin disorder, but because it's more painful than androgenetic alopecia, there's an urgency to address it. But something doesn't need to be painful for it to be treated or seen as a disease, or even a disorder. Alopecia areata is another hair loss condition. And here it's almost often painless, but it's the immune system that's attacking the hair follicles for whatever reason, and primarily it's genetics, but we're seeing the immune system destroy a fundamental physiological process of the hair follicle, which is its ability to grow hair. So because it isn't painful, are we going to say that alopecia areata is not a skin condition, is not a skin disease, is not a, you know, a disease of the scalp? I don't think we say that. I don't think it's responsible to even suggest that. And now you have emerging research that also potentially implicates DHT and androgen receptors in macrophages, a type of white blood cell that is crucial in the body's immune response and typically 
involved in wound healing and inflammation. And the inflammation, which is a fundamentally protective and reparative process, has often led to chronic inflammation, right? If there's something that's causing you to be chronically inflamed, that can actually become very detrimental, leading to tissue damage and prolonged injury, potentially exasperating hair follicle miniaturization and permanent loss. So these macrophages, these white blood cells that are involved in the immune response to inflame a certain area to try to clean things up, they have androgen receptors. And in theory, there might be some sort of genetic basis here to it because this isn't happening with everyone, right? But in theory, DHT could overexcite the androgen receptors in these macrophages, causing for a runaway inflammatory response that can potentially lead to other hair loss conditions like CCCA, LLP, and much more. Even in androgenetic alopecia itself, there are inflammatory aspects that ultimately result in further damage to the hair follicle. So I'm saying all this to tell you that, hey, there's a reason why they refer to androgenetic alopecia as skin disease or skin disorder. And just because in most people there's no pain involved or associated with it, that doesn't mean it cannot be classified as so. Also, I found this particular study titled, quote, Dihydrotestosterone DHT enhances wound healing of major burn injury by accelerating resolution of inflammation in mice, unquote. And this study is really interesting. I'm not going to review it here, but it goes to show how DHT can accelerate the inflammatory process and wound healing in mice. Now, I know this is a animal model, and it's not even an animal that's closely related to humans. But for those of you who have been keeping up with the vertiporfin videos that I've been putting out, and along with the vertiporfin case reports and clinical trials being conducted by Dr. Barguthi and Dr. Bloxham, and also what we know about mammalian healing when it comes to wound healing and the inflammatory process with YAP signaling the yes-associated protein and even SDF1, I think we can also look at DHT being a significant factor in that excessive or fast wound repair. So it can heal wounds pretty fast or contribute to wounds being healed fast by starting the inflammatory process sooner due to the androgen receptors that exist in these cells that are responsible for wound healing. So that would be the fibroblast, the macrophage, neutrophil, monocyte, B cell, T cell, all these things that DHT can potentially upregulate and cause for inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling, which ultimately results in fibrosis. So I know this is a bit out of the topic of the video, but I have to address it here. If we're going to use vertiporfin to reverse fibrosis or scarring that has occurred on the scalp, and even to bring back and restore miniaturized hair follicles, I think we do have to address the microenvironment that exists in that particular area. And that would be DHT. We want to reduce DHT as much as we can in the scalp so we can potentially control those runaway inflammatory responses that may be caused by DHT. So yeah, I have to just put that in there. Maybe I'll cut this out and upload this as its own video. If this is uploaded separately, this is coming from my response to Bald Cafe's video that addresses the hair loss industry, essentially playing on people's fears. So yeah, going back to the video. Doctors, all these studies, all this stuff, being like, mate, this disease, needing medical intervention disease, you know, you're going to be like, oh no, what's wrong with me? I've got this disease. It's scary, to be honest. It's scary, right, how far this has come. So commercial interventions might themselves induce poor quality of life. Of the studies that made an intervention recommendation, 96% of those recommended commercial interventions right yet only one study recommended psychological interventions this is just something to to ponder on at this stage bold men should be offered a menu of responses right including not intervening accepting okay dare i say it just going bald a medical professional who himself is bald okay this guy he said, certainly the safest and least invasive way to address the psychological impact of baldness is through psychological counseling. This might include psychosocial interventions to promote appearance acceptance. Let's get on to the crux of the matter here, guys. It is possible 
that the medicalization of baldness itself causes distress rather than baldness per se. So what we're pondering here That's all of the Bald Cafe video that I'll be playing, so if you want to see the full thing, I'll put the link in the description. But really, I think Bald Cafe and the paper he was reading were kind of going a bit on a tangent there for a second, and I guess they were kind of missing the point here. It isn't the media that creates some sort of insecurity with balding, right? Maybe if the media were to be pushing images of, you know, balding being cool and whatever, that could have some sort of socially positive aspects towards balding or going bald. But there's a reason why that's not happening, right? The media primarily has to appeal to people's preferences and images, self-images, and maybe even insecurities, right? So that means the insecurity isn't necessarily coming from the media itself. It can definitely be compounded. I'm not going to deny that. But mostly it's in the realization that people are becoming insecure because their very image that they've seen in the mirror, it's changing, right? And sure, going to counseling can help you cope with your image, but also at the end of the day, we have to be quite honest here. And I don't say this to people to try to make them feel bad, it's just the truth. And I'm not saying you can't have a life if you've lost your hair completely. I would never say that, there's more to life than just hair, but it would be nice to keep your hair as long as you can, right? But you know, biological preferences that people have, men and women, they don't want to see a bald scalp or they don't look for that, right? That's not what they primarily find appealing. And if you're kind of losing in that department, in the hair department, you need other things to make up for it, right? Maybe you're, I don't know, 6'8". There was this one time I was in a bar and this dude was 6'8", completely mogged me and took the chick that I was talking to. Okay, we can all admit that, right? You know, I'm I'm 5'11", but I guess being 6'8 probably would have, you know, made it all the more appealing. But also, you know, there are other aspects to that, right? He was also a basketball player as well. There are other things you can do to compensate for the lack of, you know, having the best head of hair or growing hair at all. Maybe you can go out and make more money. Maybe you can, I don't know, find a chick that has some sort of sick fetish for bald scalps I, there are women out there like that right maybe you can just go find a chick that doesn't care or who's okay with it right you can do all these other things right but it doesn't get away from the fact that at the end of the day people just prefer hair and it isn't the media that's causing that preference to happen it's just this underlying biological preference that many people have and there are societies out there where the view of balding or being bald is different it provokes images of seniority and wisdom, right? You've been around for a long time, but the issue here is that it's happening to people that are like 20, 18. I had a subscriber email me, 16 Norwood 5. Like, you know, this is, this is the issue here, right? So if they were 30, maybe, okay, it sucks. Even if you lose it in your 30s, it's much more understandable though. If you're in your 20s, if, you, if you're young, right? If you're 80, who gives a shit, right? So I think we have to have a bit of a balanced perspective here rather than just saying, it's the hair loss industry and this particular industry is causing insecurities and it's big pharma and big hair follicle that seems to be causing us to have distrust with our hair and it's making society, you know, it's causing women not to give me the time of day. No, it's just the reality that it's just not preferred. That is the reality. And helping people come to that reality and not lying to them. And also, if you do help them come to that reality and you supply them with potential solutions, right? You don't have to sort of give them just bad information that causes them to lose their hair. And then let's say a decade or so down the line, they found out that, or they find out that, wait, I could have done that to save my hair follicles, right? There are people that comment on my channel who are like in their 30s, 40s, who thought Propecia and Finasteride were just bullshit because people in their lives told them that, oh, nothing will work. Those things don't work. In reality, they do. And now that we're seeing the rise of telehealth services and the advertising of Finasteride, Dutasteride, and other sort of hair loss solutions, these people are depressed. These people are like, man, these tools already existed? I just didn't know about it? Were people gaslit me to accepting this condition when I could have held my hair for longer? I feel bad.
and I th- even even if other people have more severe hair loss, right, and all these treatments that they're doing only slows it down by, let's say, a year. They get to keep their hair for at least a year. You know, that could mean a lot. You know, maybe you can find someone to settle with, a chick that sees you and, you know, we're all shallow to an extent. Maybe she sees you with hair and is able to at least approach you or you're able to at least get a conversation with that chick, that woman, that woman, woman, right? And then from there, she can see your personality, right? Maybe that can happen just by having a year or two or three or four with your hair, right? Now, I'm not saying that that's how long Finash Dread will keep your hair, but I'm just using it as an example. Let's not try to be bitter because we have worse conditions and that and you know that whole misery loves company thing. Let's not try to bring other people down with us because uh, we may be too far along, right? Like if you're a Norwood 7 or a Norwood 6, if I was a Norwood 6, right? If I was a Norwood 6, just finding out about all the information that I know now, I wouldn't just give people like opposite information because I want them to be just like me, right? I would give them as much information as I can so they wouldn't have to become a Norwood 6. Now, I am not a Norwood 6. I have to stress that because some people, they don't really listen to these videos properly, so they just assume crazy things anyway. But my point is, let's give people the tools to help them, right? And I think he read a part in that study, right? Give men a menu of options. But that study was stressing. It seemed as if it was pushing in the direction not study it, sorry, the paper, it seemed as if it was it was pushing in that direction of saying, don't do anything at all. Just deal with it. Is that really a balanced approach here? So that pretty much sums up my point. I think Bald Cafe is doing a good job helping, you know, the other side of this whole thing. People just coming to accept, you know, not doing treatment at all. But I think he tends to get a bit overzealous in that particular department of, you know, treatment. And then he goes on to make these sweeping generalizations saying that yeah, big pharma is an issue or the hair loss industry is the issue here and you should just accept it. No, the reality is that there's a market, people have concerns, they want to have this particular condition addressed. So the companies in those markets or industry, whatever, they try to appeal to those customers to get money, right? But also to ideally address their concerns. And at least in the hair loss industry there are so many fake products and scam oils that sometimes cause harm there are people who are allergic to things like rosemary and castor oil and all these excess oils that could possibly cause an inflammatory cascade that ultimate that ultimately just destroys their hair follicles and their scalp there are aspects of the hair loss industry that are toxic and that is just built on misinformation. But when we're talking about things like finasteride, dutasteride, and other forms of experimental research chemicals, as well as what is currently in the pipeline, right? If anything, and I'm not a big pharma shill, but if anything, the pharmaceutical aspect of the hair loss industry does more to address the concerns that people have than these like one-off like scam shops. And I'm talking about Cosma RNA here too as well. Fuck that, you know, product. It's a scam. It's been proven as a scam at this point. But anyway, I digress. That's it for this video. If you got this far to the end, please comment in the comment section below. New hair. New hair. N-E-W-H-A-I-R. New hair. And yeah, that's pretty much it. See you on the next video and peace out. Also, yesterday was Christmas. I have a lot of videos to edit and I actually recorded some videos on Christmas. So I'll be like peppering them along the way. And my birthday's tomorrow, December 27th. So I'll be 23 years old. That's two decades and three years. Seems like things are going by fast.